بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد In the next few minutes, I wanted to go over 10 very, very important guidelines and pieces of advice for every student of knowledge. Insha'Allah, if a person takes these guidelines with uh, importance, insha'Allah ta'ala, he will be successful in his path of seeking knowledge. The very first guideline that I wanted to mention is revering this knowledge and valuing it. And that is because a person cannot be successful in anything that he wants to study unless he reveres and respects that knowledge that he is studying, unless he values it and understands its importance. For example, if a person wanted to uh, become a computer programmer and he studies computer science, if he doesn't have a love for it, if he doesn't have respect for it, if he does not revere it, if he does not understand its value, its importance, he will not be successful in his studies. Similarly, with regards to this Islamic knowledge, a person has to revere it, he has to respect it. And that is because there is no better knowledge for a person to study than this knowledge, the knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say that uh, a, a particular field of knowledge uh, its importance and value is known by looking at that which is being studied. And so what is being studied? It is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person is studying about Allah, about what Allah has commanded us with, and about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for us if we follow His commands. And so there is no doubt that a person if he wants to be successful in seeking this knowledge, he must revere it and he must have great respect for it. The second guideline that I wanted to share is cleansing the vessel of knowledge. And so every single thing has a vessel. And the vessel of knowledge is none other than the heart. And so if the heart is clean, if it is pure, then it will be able to receive and intake and absorb the knowledge that it gets. However, if the heart is unclean, if it is dirty, if it is filthy, then it will not be able to receive any of the knowledge. And an example of this is a lantern. A lantern is covered by glass and if one wants the light to be bright and radiant then the glass must be clean it must not be dirty because if it is dirty it will not give out any light and so knowledge is similar to this if the heart is not clean then the light will not penetrate, the light of knowledge will not benefit the person. And so if you truly want to gain knowledge of this deen, you have to first start by cleaning your heart. What is it that we clean our heart of? Two things, shubuhat and shahawat. Shubuhat are the various uh, doubts that shaitan tries to put in our hearts, and so we must free ourselves of these doubts, we must clean our hearts of these shubuhat. And as for the shahawat, then they are the desires, the lusts of the dunya, that a person must clean his heart of. When a person does that, his heart becomes clean and he is ready to receive and intake this knowledge. This is why Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. He said, if our hearts were clean, they would never become tired of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third guideline that I want to mention is sincerity of intention. Ikhlas or sincerity of intention is one of the most important 
things that a student of knowledge must focus on. And that is the question of why he is seeking knowledge. One must always ask himself, why have I set on this path of seeking knowledge? Is it so that I can become famous? Is it to achieve some worldly gain so that I can achieve some kind of status? Is it to show off? What is the reason behind my seeking this knowledge? And so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned regarding the importance of having the correct intention behind seeking knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever learns and seeks knowledge which is supposed to be sought solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not learn it. He does not seek this knowledge except to fulfill some worldly gain. He will not find the scent of Jannah. He will not find the smell, the scent of Jannah on the Day of Judgment. And so this is a very serious matter that a person must have the correct intention and not have the wrong intention when setting on the path of seeking knowledge. And so the question is, what should my intention be? There are four things that our intention should revolve around. The first is to lift the ignorance off of ourselves. So your intention should be that you want to raise the ignorance off yourself regarding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires of you in terms of your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of what you must stay away from, in terms of what Allah has forbidden from you. The second uh, thing that your intention should revolve around is having the intention to raise the, the ignorance, to lift the ignorance off of others. And that is by teaching and guiding others to what is best for them in this dunya and the akhirah. And the third thing that your intention should revolve around is having the intention to revive this knowledge of Islam so that it does not disappear. So that it does not disappear. And the fourth uh, thing that your intention should revolve around is wanting to act upon this knowledge. Having the intention to act upon what you learn of this knowledge and this is why you could imagine this knowledge as being a tree. What is the benefit of the tree? The fruit that it gives. And so here you have an apple tree. The tree itself is not of much benefit. But the fruit, the apple that you get from this tree, that is where the benefit lies. And so the tree is knowledge and the fruit of the tree is the action that one implements after he has studied what he has studied of this thing. The fourth guideline is adorning oneself with the manners of a student of knowledge. And so the student of knowledge must have the best of Islamic manners. And that is because he is studying this deen and he needs to implement what he studies of this deen. And so having the adab and the akhlaq of a student of knowledge, such as being humble, putting arrogance aside, abstaining from being attached to the worldly uh, pleasures, and showing humility in the face of truth and other noble Islamic manners, a student of knowledge should focus on having these manners. And he should beware of those manners that tarnish his honor, that tarnish this very knowledge that he is seeking, such as arrogance, having envy, having evil suspicion, uh, backbiting. Uh, looking down upon others, being boastful, and so on and so forth. These are manners and characteristics that he must put aside. And this is why the Salaf used to give a lot of importance to 
uh, having the uh, proper etiquette. And this is why Ibn Sirin, one of the Salaf, he said that they, the Salaf, used to learn matters as they used to learn this knowledge. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, we are more in need of good manners than a lot of knowledge. The fifth uh, guideline that I wanted to mention is choosing the right teacher. And so if a student of knowledge wants to excel and reach somewhere in terms of his seeking knowledge, he must do so at the feet of a pious scholar and an upright teacher. A pious scholar and a teacher is recognized by his knowledge of the deen and by his perseverance, his taqwa, his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his amana, his trustworthiness. And so if a person finds these characteristics in a scholar and in a teacher, then he should take his knowledge from him. Uh, and that is because a person cannot gain knowledge of this deen on his own by simply reading from the books. This is not the way a person will benefit and gain knowledge of this deen. Because it is said that a person who makes his books his teacher, his mistakes and his, his slips are more than uh, his correctness. And another benefit that a person gains from taking knowledge from the scholars is that he gains from their manners and their characters their akhlaq and their adab. This is why it is said that Imam Ahmed, in his gatherings, there used to be 5,000 students, of only which 500 would be recording and writing, while the rest would be taking from his good manners, his characters, and from his noble behavior. And so, Imam al-Awza'i, he used to say that this knowledge of Islam used to be passed down generation to generation, from men to men. However, when it entered the books, the wrong people became involved in it. And that is because, like I mentioned, a person cannot gain knowledge from books alone. He must have a teacher, a scholar who he takes his knowledge from. The sixth guideline is prioritizing and moving up the ladder of knowledge gradually, in a gradual stage. And so this is achieved by building a strong foundation, by building a strong foundation with the most essential, uh, the most essential aspects of knowledge that a student of knowledge requires, such as those things that a person uh, requires in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has to build his knowledge on these things first, then he moves on to the other aspects of knowledge that are more advanced. It is said that uh, whoever does not perfect the foundation, he is prevented from reaching their, his aim in knowledge. And that is because if you want to build a house, you have to have a strong foundation. If you start by building the walls and the roof and the windows, then the house will fall apart. So in this same manner, a student of knowledge must perfect his foundation. He must build a strong foundation. Then he must build upon that. And it is also said that whoever tries to uh, attain knowledge in one go, he will lose it in one go. And that is why if we were to analyze and reflect over how the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet wasallam, we find that it was not revealed in one go. It was not given to the Prophet wasallam in one uh, sitting and in one revelation. Rather, the revelation came to the Prophet wasallam over a span of 23 years. And this is why 
the kuffar, they actually objected to this. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدًا The disbelievers, they said, uh, why was this Qur'an not revealed in one go? Why was it not revealed at once, at one time? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ تَرْتِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, thus it, thus it is, the revelation came uh, uh, over a period of time, not in, not in one go, thus, so that we may strengthen your heart thereby, and we have revealed it to you gradually in stages. So a student of knowledge, if he wants to really benefit, uh, he must first build his foundation strong, and then build upon that, not try to get this knowledge all at one time, for he will fail if he attempts to do that. The scholars of Islam did not become scholars in one night, in one month, in one year, not even in ten years. They became scholars over decades of studying this religion and giving it 100% of their time. The seventh guideline is spending one's energy in memorizing, revising, and inquiring. And that is because a student of knowledge, it is not sufficient for him to simply take the knowledge from the scholar or his teacher without memorizing, without revising what he has memorized, and without inquiring, asking his teacher about that which he did not understand. At the same time, this does not mean that a person should memorize without understanding. This is why the scholars have said that uh, memorization without comprehension, without understanding, is ignorance and self-conceit. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, comprehension and understanding without memorization is a drawback and deficiency. So the two go hand in hand. And Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen uh, mentioned that they would memorize uh, very little. They had memorized very little and they had read a lot. They had memorized very little and read much. He said, however, later on in their, in their lives, they had benefited more from that which they memorized than from that which they read. Why? Because that which you memorize, it remains with you forever. Whereas that which you read, and try to understand without memorizing, it will go away as time goes by. The very first thing that a student of knowledge must uh, memorize without any doubt is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many reports from the Salaf and the scholars of the past in which uh, it is mentioned that they would never accept a student to study under them unless they had first finished memorizing the Qur'an. After a student of knowledge has memorized the Qur'an, he can move on to memorizing the Sunnah. And so he should take a small, concise book on the Ahadith of the Prophet wasallam and memorize it, such as Al-Arba'oon al nawawiya the 40 Ahadith of al nawawi and then he could go on to memorize other books of Hadith. And so in this manner, he takes a small, concise book in all of the subjects that he studies and memorizes it so that he could build for himself a strong foundation. However, it is not simply enough to memorize, and that's why we mentioned that it is important that a person uh, spends time revising that which he has memorized. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told us about the one who memorizes the Qur'an by heart. He said, the parable, the example of the one who memorizes the Qur'an by his heart is like the owner of the camel who ties his camel. If he remains vigilant in making sure that it is tied, then he will be able to retain it and he will be able to control it. However, if he neglects it and does not tie it, it will run away. And so the Qur'an is exactly the same. And so if this is the Qur'an, then how about all the other things that we memorize? And so, it is very, very important that we pay attention to revising that which we have memorized. Not only that, 
but we must inquire and ask our teachers and the scholars about that which we do not understand from what we have memorized. And so these three uh, points, memorization, revision, and inquiring, are like a tree that a person plants, that he waters, and that he cultivates. Memorization is planting the tree. Revision is watering, giving the tree water. And inquiring is cultivating the tree, developing it, and so on and so forth. The eighth guideline is allowing the knowledge to penetrate deep into the heart. And so if one wants to be successful in seeking knowledge of this deen, he must allow his heart to become attached to this knowledge which he is seeking. And allow that knowledge to penetrate deep into his heart so that it becomes the most beloved thing to him more than anything else in this dunya. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, whoever does not make the desire for knowledge to become triumphant over the desire of his body and his nafs, he will never attain the status of scholarship in this deen. And so, this is done by implementing the guidelines which we have mentioned, uh, by having the correct intention, by putting one's energy into memorizing, into revising, and all of the things that we have mentioned and that we will mention, insha'Allah ta'ala. So if a person implements these guidelines into his life, then he will be able to allow this knowledge to penetrate deep into his heart until it becomes the most beloved thing uh, to him. And one of the scholars of the past, he said that one will never find a pleasure for this knowledge until he becomes hungry and forgets about his hunger. And so, if a person has reached such a status that uh, he becomes hungry and he forgets about his hunger, it proves that his heart is not attached to this dunya, rather it is attached to that knowledge. The ninth guideline is preserving one's time with knowledge. And so if we have understood that knowledge of this deen is the most important goal that one should make, and one of the most noble of things that one can gain, and we find that our lifespans are short, and that time goes by quickly, especially in the times that we live in today, it is only logical for a person to preserve this time in making sure that he preserves it in seeking knowledge and not allowing a single hour, rather even a single minute to go by without benefiting in seeking knowledge. And this is why the Prophet wasallam he told us to take advantage of five things before another five. And one of the things that he had mentioned is our free time before our busy time. So we must take advantage of our free time. We must take advantage of this free time that we have in spending it in seeking knowledge, not allowing a single hour to go by in which we uh, are simply uh, enjoying ourselves or, uh, you know, wasting our time. This is why it is said that Time is like a sword. If you do not cut it, it will cut you. And it is also said, if you do not busy, if you do not busy your time with that which is right, it, meaning time, will busy you with that which is wrong. And Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, he says that if part of my time is wasted without beneficial guidance or knowledge, then it is lost time. And so the scholars of the past, they used to pay a lot of importance to making sure that their time is used wisely uh, in uh, beneficial knowledge. And there are many, many examples of this from the lives of the scholars of, their, of the past. 
if it was not for time, I would have mentioned uh, some of those examples. But the point is that if we want to truly uh, benefit from seeking knowledge, we must use our time wisely and uh, take an example from the scholars of the past by reading their biographies and seeing how they benefited from their time. The tenth and final guideline is acting upon knowledge. And this final point is of utmost importance. It is, in fact, the most important thing that a student of knowledge should focus on after the point that we mentioned regarding sincerity of intention. And that is because this knowledge is intended for the implementation that it requires. And as we mentioned earlier, imagine this knowledge to be like a tree. The tree in and of itself is not of much benefit. However, the fruit that it bears, that is where the benefit lies. And so the fruit is the action of the knowledge. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said that uh, when one of us would learn 10 ayat of the Qur'an, he would not go beyond them until he has learned their meanings and acted upon them. And so the Sahaba and the Salaf used to pay a lot of attention to implementing the knowledge that they had. By implementing one's knowledge, he makes that knowledge firmly rooted within himself. This is why the scholars in the past, they said that they used, to, uh, they used to retain this knowledge and make it uh, firmly rooted within themselves by acting and implementing upon it. That way they were able to retain it and not forget it. And by implementing one's knowledge, he is giving the zakat of his knowledge. He is giving the zakat of his knowledge. And so a person, a student of knowledge, should be very, very careful of committing sins. Because sins, committing sins, goes against this principle of acting upon the knowledge that you have. This is why Imam Shafi'i, he said in famous lines of poetry, شَكَوْتُ إِلَى وَكِيعُ سُوءَ حِفْظِي فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَى تَرْكِ الْمَعَاصِي I complained to Waqiyah, Waqiyah was the teacher of Imam Shafi'i, I complained to Waqiyah about my poor memory. So he advised me to abandon sins. وَأَخْبَرَنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورُ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُهْدَى لِعَاصِي And he informed me that knowledge is a virtue and the virtue of Allah is not given to a sinner. And so this was Imam Shafi'i, the great scholar of Islam. So how about us? Who commit sins daily without even caring about that. And so we must be very careful and we must be very, very careful to stay away from sins and implement the knowledge that we have. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us to benefit from the knowledge that we gain. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our intentions purely for His sake. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to implement this knowledge that we have. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka. وأتوب إليك